morning all so i think um there's daylight and there's a fly firefly so firefly here um so thank you uh, for the inspirational um, talk professor louisa torsi and dr karaha uh, it was wonderful and it's inspirational and it's something that i would dream to be one day uh, thank you so much for that having said that i'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderfully organized event and it's it's been it's been a very good learning experience for me so i'm arjun mohan i'm a, a mrcm research fellow at the university of liverpool so before starting i'd like to go a bit into the history of alzheimer's disease so what anybody be able to identify these two people other than being old photographs uh, that were taken in the black and white era anyone um so yeah so the person on the on the right hand side that you see is alois alzheimer he was the first person who actually uh, found this uh, pre senile dementia uh, in, in the first patient uh, who was augustita uh, augustita started showing some symptoms like behavioral changes and memory losses which actually uh, which actually prompted him to study more and in, more into her characteristics and present his findings at a conference incidentally he presented his findings at a conference that uh, of psychiatrists who were not very interested uh, in his findings mainly because of his subsequent talk you, you can learn more about that in wikipedia it's a very interesting uh, story actually uh, so having said that have if the audience uh, if the audience of that they actually re recognize the the dangers that disease disease, disease actually uh, possessed they would have actually given more attention so about 132 million people worldwide are expected to have dementia by 2050 so and among them alzheimer's disease would be the most common cause of dementia so alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disorder uh, a progressive brain disease that actually causes impair impairment in memory and cognitive function um so in the uk alone alzheimer's disease accounts for 62% of all the dementia cases uh and the cost of dementia is huge the especially with the with the healthcare sectors all across the countries especially the uk and japan uh having huge uh cost being incurred in, in caring for these patients uh so we initially we'll see what a healthy brain looks like and what an alzheimer's disease a brain with alzheimer's disease looks like so a healthy brain has the functional units of the brain called neuron so they are actually stabilized by tau proteins uh which are um which actually give a very good structural integrity to the neuron however when you have an alzheimer's disease you have hypophosphorylated tau proteins that actually disrupt the structure of the neurons and hence they're not able to function properly uh, whereas they and in addition to that they also have a myelot beta plaques that prevent the transmission of impulses from one neuron to the next uh because of which it impairs the function of the neuron um so current diagnostics in terms of alzheimer's disease you have pet scans uh which are uh which are very costly uh which are not very patient friendly uh and the second one you have is uh lumbar puncture uh taking out the spinal fluid and then then you analyzing it using uh, elisa or samoa um so in terms of cost and in terms of patient discomfort both of these techniques are not not very i mean not very preferred but unfortunately these are the only ones that are available at the moment uh so if if you see the so uh, this actually points to a necessity to shift from uh csf based diagnostics to uh maybe blood based diagnostics using a very minimally invasive technique so there have been a lot of uh, there has been a lot of work actually to uh understand the presence of these biomarkers in blood um there's been uh, and i would actually point out the, to these three three uh work because well it's tau proteins one tau proteins have this uh, have a characteristic of being diagnostic and prognostic in nature so diagnostic in the sense that they can actually predict the presence of a disease in a person and prognostic because it can actually predict the amount of neurodegeneration this actually helps us to basically tune the treatment protocol so that they, that level of neurodegeneration can be maintained there is no reversal of neurodegeneration till the at, at present so having discussed blood so now we come to electrochemical uh, sensors because electrochemical sensors are kind of cost effective um uh, and also they can be turned they can be tuned to be point of care based devices so if you see the literature at the moment there are a lot of there are a lot of work basically being done for the for the detection of tau proteins in uh, in in different matrices uh, and especially i I'd, i'd like to draw your attention to the first one wherein they've used a, a probe basically that is immobilized on top of the electrode surface so you do not need any external probe to be supplied uh which actually basically brings in a technology where you just give a drop of blood and then you can detect the presence of that biomarker in in the matrix and the second one is actually this is the only work that has actually gone down to femtomolar uh, femtomolar levels uh, in terms of a li limit of detection for electrochemical sensing so um the ideal levels that you would actually be aiming to be at would be uh, upper femtomolar and maybe in the mid uh, mid pico level mid pico molar levels maybe 20 to 30 pico molar of uh, of this protein in the blood um so what is the innovation gap that we have right now so we have to have a point of care 
uh, kind of a device for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, we need it to be time and cost saving, and we also need it to be specific. So because of this, we've actually came, we came up with a, a, with a plan to actually use a point of care uh, device that does not require any external rock probe to be used. So you just need um, uh, you just need a drop of blood and we, we need the sensing to happen. The second one, it needs to be specific. So we, we've come up with uh, we've come up with a plan to use uh, molecularly imprinted polymers. So molecularly imprinted polymers are plastic antibodies. So it's kind of like a negative mold of an antibody but has all the functional groups. So the specificity area of the antibody would be taken care of. Uh, without having to have the uh, the storage requirements of using any uh, a, a, a bioreceptor. And three, we've actually used uh, a 2D material that is a very uh, a recently innovated material called Mexine uh, to actually bring in the amplification factor. And these Mexines have known to be biocompatible because they've been used in uh, tissue and cell lines. They've, they've, known, they've, not be, they've not actually incurred any kind of uh, immune responses from the cell lines, basically. Um, so this is the plan that we went through. Initially, we used a, uh, we used a, a screen printed electrode, a gold electrode, and we used a polyenlene as the uh, molecular independent polymer. We electropolymerized it with uh, the tau, uh, tau protein that was there. And then we uh, removed the template using template removal, like using oxalic acid. And finally, we initially, to characterize the uh, these functioning of the sensor, we uh, went on to two different techniques, one of the impedance spectroscopy and electrochemical impedance spectroscopy and also the voltammetry. So on both of these techniques, we've used Ferrisan as the external probe. We just wanted to see if this, this particular MIP was able to sense uh, tau proteins, all the, uh, sense tau proteins at all, and we were able to see that the uh, sensor was able to detect all the way from 50 femtograms to 500 nanograms uh, in, uh, in using Ferrisan as the mediator. But the whole idea was to shift towards a mediate a free system. And because of that, we went on to use a polydopamine based system uh, to uh, mobilize it on top of the electrode surface so that you could get um, um, a, redox, uh, a redox readout without having to use any external probes. So we used Mexine as the uh, platform to increase the loading of the tau proteins. So if you see on the same images on the left hand side, we have Mexine, uh, the pristine Mexine material, which is just a layered kind of a material. But then when you have electropolymerize it on the uh, polydopamine based surface, uh, you polymerize polydopamine on the mexine surface, you have it covered with a layer. Basically, we have characterized this layer and we've found out that it is uh, it is a thin layer of polydopamine that has been coated on top of the material. So we do the same uh, the same process that I elucidated earlier, wherein we uh, we are, we put the mexine based PDA on the surface, followed by the electropolymerization of the MIP, uh, and then we um, we incubate different concentrations of this tau protein onto the sensor surface, and we we see a basic, basically a current reduction uh, that is proportional to the presence of tau protein uh, in the blood. So in order to in order to actually justify why we used mexine polydopamine, I compared it with a with a normal polydopamine sensing surface, and we could actually see the amplification coming in already. So when we used a, a, a polydopamine surface alone, the there was a high impedance that we observed actually. So it was on the order of a thousand ohms maybe, and uh, the on the on the um, mexine based polydopamine surface, the uh, resistance was all almost of the order of 150 ohms, which means that there is a huge conductivity improvement or amplification that we see when we bring in the mexine uh, for the uh, for the uh, coating of the polydopamine. So on the pro to uh, appropriate detection of tau proteins, we actually use this whole sensor surface for detecting tau proteins in, uh, in, in artificial interstitial fluid, which had some of the uh, interference that we see uh, in, in, um, um, in, in interstitial fluid or in blood. And uh, we were able to see that we were detecting uh, seven, almost six to seven orders of magnitude of tau proteins in, 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 the, uh, in the interstitial fluid. And we also followed it up with making a handheld device, uh, which could actually detect the presence of tau protein in, in simulated body fluid. Simulated body fluid is actually a matrix that is similar to blood, uh, and um, and it, there are more interference to be added. But then, uh, in the presence of common interference, we are able to detect these tau proteins all the way from maybe uh, five femtograms to uh, earlier, from five femtograms to five nanograms. And this is what we've done using this device as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, how close are we to the reference value that we that we provide to the device, we've seen that the reference um, uh, minus observed, you, you could see that there is not much of a difference uh, from the reference value. And this means that our device is actually able to uh, predict these values that we give it with a good amount of certainty, which means that we are on track 
to uh, uh, incorporate a device that can actually be used for the detection of tau protein directly uh, from any sample uh, from a sample matrix like blood. Uh, so in conclusion, what we've had is like we have a proprietary detection of tau proteins in a complex matrix. We've used a PD VXPDA based composite for amplification. We have a good dynamic range from 122 atomolar per liter to 122 picomolar per liter. Um, we have a low cost about, so the device on the whole was about 20 pounds. Uh, and in so if you bring in the electrode cost, the electrode cost is about, we use a drop sensor electrode, which is about six uh, pounds per electrode. But then depending upon if you have a low cost electrode, we can actually incorporate it this device and bring the cost further down. Uh, we have a tau detection within a short span of 32 minutes in comparison to the 48 hours that are required right now for the uh, for the detection of these um, these molecules in uh, these molecules in the uh, in in a human sample. Finally, so in future we want to use a more electrochemically robust active layer. Basically, we want to use it for the detection of tau 181 in whole blood because tau 181 has been shown to be present in whole blood uh, by a lot of other studies that I I have shown earlier. Uh, so because in whole blood because there are a lot of components in blood and we need to actually engineer the sensor surface to be not uh, affected by the presence of all of these components that are there in whole blood. And so we also need, we also aim to bring in some data analytics and predictive algorithms so that you can actually have a reproducible, uh, a repeatable, and also highly specific sensor surface so that we can actually have a high performance uh, Alzheimer's diagnosis just in blood instead of the usual um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid or the PET scans that we use. So, and also we need to benchmark it with maybe uh, with Samoa and also ELISA techniques to actually show that that device actually performs at par with all of these established techniques that are there. Uh, so acknowledgements, I'd like to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, who's here. So thank you so much for the support and mentorship that you've been giving me uh, for this work and for every other work of, li of, work of life. And also Mr. Sudhansh Deshpande, without whom this device would not have been possible. We have also have um, Tom Dunlop who helped extensively with the, uh, the material characterization. The other members of the team, Beth Norman, Daniela Oliveira, and Dr. Felizmina, who were uh, instrumental in the initial part of this work. Um, and Georgetta Volpe for, for all the characterization help that she's given me on this. Uh, and finally, nothing would have happened without the funding body that is um, the UKRIMRC and also AMET who are actually funding this work. And also for the uh, all the support that we've received from Swansea University and the University of Liverpool. Thank you. And with this, I'm ready to take any questions that you may have.